Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblyman De Silva. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblyman Koenig. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Assemblywoman Taylor. Here. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Chair Torres. Welcome to the audience in Carson City, those joining us in Las Vegas and those listening over the internet. Uh, as a reminder to co the committee, um, we are celebrating Tribal Day at the legislature, so we're excited with uh, the presentations that we'll have in our committee. Uh, some housekeeping items, just a reminder to please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time you're done speaking. Uh, if you had any handouts, hopefully you provided 20 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to our committee manager by noon yesterday for members of the committee. We expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we may not agree with another person's position. Committee members will be using their laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please do not view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. For a lot of our committee members, this is how we see the presentations, because it's a little awkward <laughs> off to the side in this committee room. Please, com a public comment will will be taken at the end of the meeting. Each person will be limited to two minutes. In addition, the public may submit written testimony to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. At this time, we will we'll go ahead and begin with our presentation um, from the Nevada Indian Commission. Uh, the, Tammy Tiger is a member, and then uh, Stacy Montooth. Hama. I'm Stacy Montooth. I'm a citizen of the Walker River Paiute Nation, and I'm the executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission. Happy Valentine's Day. Moreover, happy Nevada Tribes Legislative Day. In the next few minutes, myself and my colleague will provide information to this committee about what the Nevada Indian Commission does when it was established and our goals. I'm gonna turn the mic over to my colleague to introduce herself. Hale Toyokpa, so Chief Oyat, Tammy Tiger, Chattasia, Muskogisia, okay. My name is Tammy Tiger. I'm a citizen of Choctaw Nation and descendant of Muskogee people. I serve with the Nevada Indian Commission and I'm here visiting from Nuwu Lands in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for having us. Stacy Monty for the record. So Throughout Indian country, we always start any kind of formal present with a presentation with a land acknowledgement. That's more important than ever today. So, um, Commissioner Tiger. The Numa, the Nua, the Nuwuvi, Washishu, and Pipa Ahamakav have lived in the Great Basin since time began. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude to our five major indigenous groups the Northern Paiute, the Shoshone, the Southern Paiute, the Washoe, and the Mojave. Not just the original caretakers of the land we now call Nevada, but for their endure, enduring stewardship and protection of our shared lands and waterways. Today, the Nevada Indian Commission reaffirms its commitment to improve the quality of life for our 28 tribal nations, bands, colonies, and the 62,000 plus urban Indians who choose to make Nevada their current home. Ms. Uh, I apologize, um, uh, Director Montooth, if you could make sure your mic is on. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Stacy Montooth, for the record. So the Nevada Indian Commission is in statute. It was created actually in 1965. The uh, mission of our five-person agency is to improve the quality of life for those 28 tribal nations as well as all the urban Indians that make Nevada their second home. Those are tribal citizens who aren't indigenous to this land, to what is now Nevada or the Great Basin, but have chosen to live in the state of Nevada. Basically, my agency is the conduit between our 28 tribal governments and the governor's office. 
we wanted to talk a little bit about our priorities. Um, again, our role is to be the liaison to take uh, important matters from our tribal governments or to uh, from our urban citizens to the governor's office or in our case today to uh, any elected officials. We have probably four major areas of focus, education, economic development, employment, um, health and human services, of course, the environment, and we also want to make sure that all of our tribal nations have a direct connection to business enterprises. I just wanted to mention on this map that we've created, it's um, colored by the population. According to the 2020 census, the increase in the Native American population in our state grew from 80, grew to 89, grew 89% more than the 2020, 2010 census. And so this uh, map shows where the highest populations of our Native American, Native American residents live. Okay. So again, education is a priority. We believe, our five-person advisory board believes, it's the silver bullet. Native Americans have a very unique, perhaps described as dark history, when it comes to education and the federal government. Our efforts include a subcommittee of our agency, the Nevada Indian Advisory Committee, which is currently working on a strategic plan that melds in with the state STIP, the statewide strategic plan. We aim for equitable funding for all of our students. We have most of our reservation schools are in isolated rural areas. Um, we have students from the Yamba Nation that um, attend school in Eureka County. That requires them to get on a bus and travel for a couple hours. They have to take dirt roads. They often miss class because the roads aren't paved and they're impassable. So we look hard at trying to establish e equity for all Native learners. We have a very strong Johnson O'Malley Title um, VI program, especially in Clark County, and probably most of note recently, the last legislative session successfully passed a waiver of fees. And in a nutshell, Native Americans who are tribal citizens of our 28 tr federally recognized tribes can attend NSHE institutions, assuming that they meet the academic standards, without that huge financial hurdle. The fee waiver is what it's called, and um, most commonly referred to as tuition. So um, we had over 140 students take advantage of that last semester. So, you can't go to school if you're not healthy. So again, health and well-being is a huge priority of the Nevada Indian Commission. It's important for you all to know, we do have 28 tribal nations, but only 17 health centers. And to say health centers is a bit of an exaggeration. Um, I can tell you, um, growing up in Fallon, I went to the clinic. It wasn't a health center. There's no preventive medicine. These facilities are set up so that when you get sick, you go. Um, we have absolutely zero, no Indian Health Services hospitals. If we have elders, young people who need to have major surgery, inpatient treatment, the closest facility for them is in Phoenix, Arizona. I can't begin to tell you the hardships that that presents for our tribal citizens who often are in the lowest stratus of econo social economic status for all Nevadans. We also want to concentrate on culturally appropriate, not just mental, be uh, mental and behavioral health. Madam Chair, oh, I apologize. We also want to ensure that we have culturally appropriate care especially our elders, especially our veterans, they're so much more comfortable being treated by people that know our culture, understand the unique intricacies. I mentioned the troubled history regarding education. 
our community's history with Indian Health Service is just as fragile. And so it is extremely helpful that our communities have people that look like them, people that know the Native experience to, to provide everything from, you know, uh, checkups to um, dental health uh, to behavioral health, optical care. One of the things that we really truly believe in Indian country, what absolutely makes us the most unique is our language. We have the four major groups in this area and we work hard to ensure that there is uh, preservation for our languages. We've worked with public high schools. You can take Great Basin Paiute language in Washoe County School Districts and we look forward to that happening in all the counties in Nevada. The other really big focus, especially coming out of the pandemic and in the pandemic, was food distributions. It's intentional that our tribal lands are in isolated, remote areas. And as you all might remember, in the early days of the pandemic, you couldn't go to a major grocery store and find cleaning supplies or personal hygiene projects. You know, our relatives out in the Fallon Paiute Shoshone area, they have to drive 20 minutes to get to the closest Walmart and often during the pandemic would get there and the shelves were bare. So the Nevada Indian Commission really works with not just um, the state Department of Ag, but with our tribal nations, with um, private partners, um, the Northern Nevada Food Bank to ensure that all of our tribes have food. Would you like to address employment? Historically, Native Americans have some of the highest poverty rates per ratio and a lot of um, issues with uh, obtaining job employment. Um, there's federally funded programs uh, throughout the state for the Workforce Investment Act, um, but on reservation lands, it's even more difficult to um, have businesses that support the, the job growth needed in those families. Um, there's a recent initiative with the National Center for American Enterprise Development to work with tribes on um, helping to build their economies and economic development. You, you know that some of the um, recent business ventures are with cannabis or with gaming in our state, um, but there's also you know, a greater need for other types of industry. Um, there's also small business assistance programs that are, are coming forward and uh, more diversity programs and um, opportunities to become uh, procurement of Indian services and um, items, <laughs> purchasing items. So that's just what I want to cover on that one. I think the biggest takeaway I'd and like I apologize if you could just make sure you state your name for the record every time you all speak. Thank yes. you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission for the record. I think the biggest takeaway regarding employment and our priorities on business enterprises and economic development is to be certain that you're aware the biggest difference between a tribal government and any other government, the city of Reno, Washoe County, the state of Nevada, our tribal governments have the charge, much like you all, to provide essential services for our tribal citizens. However, we don't have a pool of money to, to grab from. Tribal governments do not tax their citizens. So in addition to ensuring that the water is clean, the roads are paved, there's supplemental services for education, our tribal governments also have to make money. They have to operate like a small business. So not only is that an additional huge challenge for our elected officials, but for our entrepreneurs as well. So there are over 574 federally recognized tribes throughout the United States. We are not monolithic. Native Americans all have their own creation stories, their own foods, their own languages. The one thing that not just Native Americans, but all indigenous people on this planet, our commonality is Mother Earth. We all have our environment as the core of our existence. So again, this is a huge priority of the Nevada Indian Commission. 
And one of the best ways that we can be effective is to work with our state agencies and our 28 tribal governments in meaningful co collaboration. We need consultation. We need to have open dialogues for any project that impacts the environment. Um, currently, the Nevada Indian Commission and our, our five advisory uh, board members are working on a written consultation plan, and that is in conjunction with AB 264 that was passed in the 2019 legislative session. Again, we have these isolated remote reservations, but prior to contact, Prior to 1864, the Paiutes, the Shoshones, the Washos, the uh, Mojave people, we never stayed in one place. We were always on the move. We weren't homesteaders. And so even though in 2023, legally, you can look at a map and see the defined areas for our 28 tribal nations, but we consider the entire Great Basin our lands, our home because that's how it was, again, before the establishment of the United States. Um, we have worked really well with the state, specifically the forestry department, with um, stewardship uh, agreements for our public lands. Um, from a federal level and with great assistance from the University of Nevada, we are working through name changes for geographical names. Um, and then as we started our presentation today, the land acknowledgments. Those are, um, you know, our intent to change the perspective and get to get um, our stakeholders, our allies to have a little different approach and remember the first peoples of these lands. Tammy Tiger, Nevada Indian Commission. I just wanted to add that um, the most important thing for our tribes is that it's acknowledged that we are sovereign nations. We are, in fact, nations in a nation who have, uh, uh, retain our, our status as citizens of our tribes. And so that's um, the underlying issue that we, we want to ensure that there is proper consultation and collaborations with the tribes in all areas of working on public lands, um, including the, op the opportunity to visit our public lands for free. Um, those national parks and state parks are originally places that our, our tribes would go to and to obtain, um, uh, I would say, uh, plants and medicines that we need for our uh, ceremony and traditional practices are important too. Thank you. So Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission for the record. That is our agency in a nutshell. We're happy to entertain questions and um, want to ensure that you all know how grateful, not just myself, but our entire um, Nevada Indian Commission Board, um, all again, all of our tribal nations and um, our community members are to have this opportunity to use this platform to share information about not just our governments but with our culture. And we stand for any questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner Tiger and uh, Executive Director Montooth for your presentation. Uh, I, I really do want to just extend my gratitude for you all coming to the Assembly Government Affairs Committee. I think this is the first time um, that we have, at least in recent history, that the, the Commission tribal leaders have had the opportunity to have a presentation in this committee. And I think it is imperative um, that we recognize the role that our, our tribal leaders have as, as government leaders uh, within their communities and how, that, how government affairs, uh, as we see legislation, how we need to consider the role that our government uh, as a state of Nevada works with tribal leaders. Um, so at this time, I will open it for questions uh, from committee members. I have Assemblywoman Taylor and then Assemblyman De Silva. Okay, and then I'll choose the next few. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. Good morning to both of you. Very, um, very um, informative uh, presentation, so I'm so glad you're here with us today. And I'm glad it's, it's Indian Day at the legislature. So, uh, Just a, a question about, you mentioned so much um, and uh, about how the, 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 the tribes have to operate as small businesses, right? And I, and I have some knowledge of that. 
<clears throat> um, but I know many people don't, so I, th I find it very interesting. So I'm just wondering if you have, um, if you know of as, as, a, as a commission or if, um, if it, uh, yourself or if any of the tribes have any interaction with the Lieutenant Governor's Office um, with their small business advocacy work or under the Nevada Business and Industry License, any interaction with them with, from that perspective? Mm -hmm. Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission, for the record, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for your question. Um, I'm really happy to tell you that this afternoon um, we are going to have the Secretary of State address our group at 1245 in room 3100. Um, I do also know that the next presentation that you all are going to have is from a tribal chair, the Reno Sparks Indian Colonies, Honorable Arlen Melendez. Um, I would ask that you pose that question okay. directly to one of our tribal chairs. Okay. Thank you so much, Edie Montooth. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I think that helps uh, our tribal chairs know the questions that we have. And if um, if it's not answered in the next presentation, too, I would definitely invite um, tribal leaders to come and testify in public comment at the end um, as well. So I'll go ahead and go to Assemblyman De Silva, then Assemblywoman Gonzalez, and Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for being here. It is, it is an honor to have uh, you, Commissioner Tiger, and Director uh, Montooth here. Uh, in this uh, building today. Thank you so much for being here and for your presentation. Uh, my question is actually to uh, Director Montooth. I know we were recently on a, uh, on a TV show at the uh, Clark County TV about a year ago, and we had a very fruitful conversation about some of the uh, education issues that uh, some of our tribal communities are, uh, are faced with. And uh, I just wanted to you know, ask you to go a little bit deeper into some of those issues that we talked about, particularly with, uh, with our, our younger, our K-12 communities and some of the challenges that we're seeing statewide. I think it's very important for uh, uh, us to have this on the public record. Thank you. Um, it's one, Stacy Montes for the record. Thank you for that question. Um, education is so complicated in Indian country. Education is such an intimate experience for any human being. Certainly there's not one size fits all. We could talk about the issues with just basic infrastructure. I know that you all are going to hear from one of our tribal chairs about the desperate need for a new school in Owyhee. Um, we have schools that are on tribal land that they're just they're just so old. Students wear coats in classes or you know they have to make arrangements because the boiler overheats certain areas. Um, the Just the physical buildings are inadequate. We have a school, our students at Fort McDermott can't drink the, out of the drinking fountains because the water isn't um, at acceptable EPA standards for them. We have students who have these massive, massive commutes and I know that um, you all probably <laughs> have to get in your cars in the morning and drive to our capital, but we're talking about those big yellow buses and again, roads that aren't paved, just getting our students to school. I talked about our focus on food, you know, nutrition is so important. I'm so thankful that the state of Nevada, our elected officials, the governor have um, continued with all of the free uh, breakfast and lunch in school. That is a tremendous aid for Indian country. That's often the most nutritious meal that our students get. So those are just a few things about the infrastructure, about the physical approach, uh, the physical um, mindset that our students, our learners have when they get to school. Again, just like all public schools, there's a shortage of, of uh, licensed teachers. Um, the curriculum, even though there are laws, we have laws in Nevada about including the history and contemporary lifestyles of Native Americans. Our teachers are so busy, they don't have time to come up with a lesson plan that's accurate, right? Native Americans typically don't have written histories. So in order for an educator to have an authentic, appropriate lesson plan, they need to talk to our elders. And that's 
that connection is just really, really difficult. We have issues with data. We have issues in that when our students fill out an application to attend school, um, it is not always clear if they're Native American. Um, federally, forms have changed to include other races. That often is the case with our people, but then what happens is the data for Native Americans is so small that typically the state reports that are generated <laughs> we're not included. We're just in that other category. So without data, it's really hard to advocate. We do know that when it comes to standardized testing, <coughs> Native American learners from read by three to the required high school standardized test, which I think maybe that might, have, might be changing, we have the lowest outcomes. When the Department of Education issued the most recent report card, Native American learners were one of two subpopulations that regressed prior to the pandemic. Our graduation rates are almost 15% lower than the average student in public schools in Nevada. Again, I would ask, please pose that question to our tribal leaders because everyone is different. You're gonna be able to hear from some of our leaders that are in urban districts identifying all our urban learners in Clark County is just, it, it really has been an impossible task for us. Thank you, thank you, Director Montuga. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cecilia Gonzalez, Assembly District 16 for the record. Um, I was just wondering, I know you got, you all had um, historic voting numbers in the last couple elections and so I was just curious what can the state do to help you all um, when it comes to administering elections in your governments thank you so Stacy Montooth the Nevada Indian Commission for the record I'm gonna just briefly um, inform you that today at 4 o'clock Commissioner Tiger and I will have an opportunity to answer that exact question to the Senate and Assembly Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. Um, I'd also like Commissioner Tiger to give you um, our latest strategies and accomplishments. Uh, with the last election, there was uh, a passage to allow for uh, not only the mail-in ballots, but to add ballot uh, drop boxes onto tribal nations. Um, the date for, that tribes needed to submit to request a polling site was extended and uh, group community members worked with all the tribal nations to try to get those forms in in time to their county clerk so that they could request those polling site locations. Um, staffing polling site locations is difficult. Uh, some tribes have to drive hours just to reach a polling site. Um, and so some of the, the concerns that we had was um, being able to register to vote with a tribal ID if you live on a tribal nation and having the ability to do that online. Um, so those are some of the challenges that our, our tribes deal with, some of the barriers and obstacles that when you're working in rural areas that our tribe, tribes face. And so if there's more of a proactive approach from the county clerks to communicate with the tribal leaders early on to ensure that they have what they need to um, ensure that there's equal access to the ballot for all tribes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much. I think I have the wrong presentation and it had voting stuff in here. Um, so I'll see you all at four o'clock again. And thank you. I, I thank you. I know that there were a couple different issues too with viewing the presentation. Uh, so thank you committee members for bearing with the committee. The committee staff has some of the systems and protocol changes. Uh, go ahead, Assemblyman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for this presentation. Uh, executive director and commissioner um, I'm I feel really honored that you were able to present to this committee something that I haven't seen in a little while and that's priorities what can we do you know you had a, a um, I look at it as being a problem and a solution and I thank you for 
um, showing that to us because I think this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, committees need to see. Um, it's, it's not a process of us guessing what we need uh, to do. You, you're showing us what we need to do for um, the community. I do have an education, I believe that was slide five, uh, 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 when you were um, speaking about K through 12. And I was just wondering if you could add the equitable funding for all students pre-K through 12, because it's essential that we get um, young minds um, in uh, that educational uh, mindset early on. And if we wait until they're kindergarten ready, we've lost almost, I believe, five years. So um, I was just wondering if you could do that. Thank you. Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission, for the record. Yes, ma'am. Vice Chair Duran. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my granddaughter was um, a recipient of the passing of the bill for the, for the schooling funding, so that was great, and it's about time. Um, my question is basically on your health care. Do you have registered doctors that are of native descent that can help you with your, your I know you use um, different uh, plants and meds for procurement of a sickness or illness. Is there native doctors that are out there or and do you treat, because I know you said you had to get the history of treating of the elders about different things. Has that been done and recorded somewhere for, for purposes like this? Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission, for, for the record, um, my mom is in cyberspace watching this and she'd be really mad if I didn't tell you all my little sister is a physician. Um, we do have native uh, doctors. Um, I think that most of our tribal governments have a health committee and they make a concerted effort to um, secure um, physicians that have uh, an indigenous or Native American heritage. Um, you know, we talked about high school and the barriers in this state. Nevada is actually a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to state data for high school students, right? In Nevada, we get about three of our students to graduate and some of the other um, heavily native populations, the, the numbers are even more dismal. Um, I would again ask you to pose that question to um, our tribal leaders, but having grown up in Indian Health Service, um, most of the physicians that I was treated by were folks that had gone through the military and were um, paying their um, debt back to the federal government by working on our reservations. We do have limited health care at the Las Vegas Indian Center, and Dr. Crystal Lee operates that. She's a, a Navajo physician. Anything else? Uh, Dr. Lee operates uh, Indigenous Health. It is a uh, culturally. And I'm, I apologize. Um, Tammy Tiger, it. Nevada Indian Commission. My apologies. Um, yes, we do have uh, definitely public health is a major. Um, um, of a lot of our, our native doctors, and so Dr. Lee operates a mental and behavioral health that um, treats native um, citizens with a culturally appropriate um, behavioral health program. And so that is uh, one of the um, uh, programs that are operated out of the Las Vegas Indian Center in the Southern Nevada. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, and I, uh, I, I do believe that is all the questions, and I know some of the members might have follow-up questions too, um, so I encourage you all to reach out um, and to make sure that we're including tribal leaders uh, in those conversation and our legislation moving forward. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Madam 
Chair, if I may, again, Stacy Montooth, Nevada Indian Commission for the record. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all of our elders in the room. We have, um, of course, I was focused on the presentation, but we have at least six tribal chairs in the room. Um, I hope that you all have time to meet them all. And I really think that this is historic, not only us getting to present to this committee, but to have witness of the highest elected officials of the sovereign nation in the room. So thank you for your time. And congratulations, you all have the first clap that we've ever received, I think, in Assembly Government Affairs. Um, but we are so excited to join this space with you all today. So we will have our next presentation from Reno Sparks Indian Colony Chair Arlen Melendez. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning, uh, committee, uh, uh, Chair Torres, and all of you who uh, we're thankful that you've given us opportunity to uh, be here this morning and to just speak on issues. Uh, my name is Arlen Melendez. I'm tribal chairman of Reno Sparks Indian Colony, located in Reno and Hungry Valley, where Washoe, Paiute, and Shoshone, three tribes, uh, uh, in one, I guess you'd say, we have members of all three tribes. Um, I've been the chairman for 32 years. Uh, this year, I've been on our tribal council 36 years, so I've uh, 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 known a lot of uh, state legislators over the years, and um, I also uh, I work with the National Congress of American Indians, which is the largest uh, political entity. I, I'm, I chair the uh, Taxation Subcommittee for the National Congress of American Indians. And uh, just wanted to, uh, Beth, this is Bethany Sam, she's our public relations uh, officer for Reno Sparks Indian Colony. And she has some slides and I'll try to uh, basically uh, follow her slides and comment on uh, some of the, uh, our presentation. So, so. Uh, first of all, uh, as a, uh, as uh, the Indian Commission has really depicted pretty much about who the tribes are. Uh, this is just a picture of, uh, of the uh, historic uh, water, the lakes that really uh, are from uh, his prehistoric Lake Lahontan that covered most of the state of Nevada. Our lakes, many of our tribes like Pyramid Lake, Walker Lake, Summit Lake, uh, all of the lakes uh, basically are remnants of that. And they tie the tribes together. Uh, many of our uh, ancestry, some of our uh, names uh, come from some of the fish and different uh, uh, food s uh, sources. But uh, so that's just a little bit about how our tribes are related. We had commerce in those days. We traded with one another. Uh, you'll find that in the, um, you know, um, about the tribes, uh, John Marshall, in the uh, Cherokee cases back in the uh, 1830s, he described us as uh, dependent uh, political entities or, or sovereign nations, you know, that were dependent on the United States. But when you really look at the word sovereignty, it really means independent, but we're still, we're still dependent on the United States. And uh, that was in the hands on our dependency on someone or the United States. First of all, uh, ending up on reservations and not being able to hunt through our aboriginal territories made us dependent on the United States. Uh, some of the acts uh, that were uh, laws that were put in place by the United States having to do with the uh, Dawes Act, those things which basically 
uh, broke up many of the Indian reservations, sold off a lot of the lands, which shrunk a lot of the uh, tribal lands, the reservations in the United States. And so uh, not only that, we went to the termination era where there were some tribes that were basically terminated as being tribes in the 1950s. And then, uh, you know, and then we had to face assimilation uh, over the years, you know, basically uh, get rid of the Indian and save the man. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, trying to overcome those things ever since, uh, you know, the uh, colonization of the uh, of our lands in this United States. Um, but we're, we're on this road back uh, to uh, where we were before. Uh, in, the, in the 1970s, uh, under the Johnson-Nixon uh, era, we have what we call the uh, self-determination era. And that's where, uh, instead of the paternalistic uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs oversight over tribes, doing everything for this, they started to let tribes they gave them the funding and basically we administer contracts and those different things through all of the different programs like law enforcement, uh, tribal courts, and uh, just about everything that the federal government funds us for, health care and everything else. Uh, then we are in the era of self-governance now. In fact, my tribe's uh, uh, just drafting a resolution for uh, next week where we're going to go self-governance for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You know that's on contract right now where we're dependent on them reporting. Uh, in our health care, we're a self-governance tribe already where we basically just get the funding and we run it ourselves, you know, and we take advantage of, uh, you know, uh, reimbursements like Medicaid and all those different things that really helps us uh, enhance. Uh, otherwise, we'd be in a shortfall for health care and being uh, uh, tribes with the highest uh, rate of diabetes and just about every every illness, you know, we kind of lead the country, it seems like, you know, for uh, just our, uh, the way we've changed our eating habits and everything else. But as you can see up there, there's just some of the, we became, uh, under the Rio Organization Act of 1935, we became uh, governments, basically, and we elected tribal councils, we had uh, constitutions that were developed on reservations, so similarly following the model of um, you know, uh, the states and the, um, the country, the United States, we have, a, we have a, a voting for our own uh, tribal um, uh, uh, chairman and our own presidents and our own council members. And so, um, uh, not only that, we, uh, we, we also have entered into agreements with the state of Nevada and some of those have been, uh, you know, jurisdictional issues. You know, it didn't start out real good as far as some of the, uh, what tribes looked at was intrusion on the tribal lands, you know, whether or not it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, fish and game or whatever it had been in those early years. As you know, right now, uh, things haven't really gone away. In uh, the Supreme Court sometimes can make rulings that affects tribes nationwide. As you know, uh, uh, the Supreme Court in the Oklahoma issue, where now um, the state has uh, concurrent jurisdiction on, on tribal lands in Arizona, which can be far-reaching to even stay our state here. And so uh, what we have to do is work together with the state, you know, and not uh, go back to the uh, old ways where there was intrusion by the states. I think we can work together, basically, and and come to a agreement as to what, what are we trying to do here. You know, we're trying to protect uh, everybody with, you know, uh, so that we can, there's not enough police officers as it is, you know, to cover, cover, cover our cities. Not only that, with uh, federal lands, you know, uh, our tribe acquired uh, an, uh, 13, uh, 13,000 13, acres of land in Hungry Valley uh, under in 19, uh, uh, 2016. And we had uh, started out with 28, 28 acres in the 1935 under the Reorganization Act. We had uh, 28 acres downtown Reno. And we've expanded to Hungry Valley, which is most of our development now. You can see some of our houses there. Uh, 
in the olden days. This was taken about in 1950, uh, 1950s. You can see some of the old houses. That house there was uh, actually belonged to one of our uh, a legislator, one of our chairmen, uh, one of the Sampsons, uh, uh, Harry Sampson, who was a leader of our tribe back in the early years, you know. And I think his brother, uh, Dewey Sampson, was a legislator here with this, one of the first in the state legislator uh, from here, you know. He's the only Native American that served in the Nevada state legislator back in those days. And then uh, you can see here we had uh, dirt roads back in those days and, and it uh, wasn't very good and we didn't have any revenue for anything back then. And then, uh, you know, then we started to take advantage of federal programs like HUD. You can see some of the HUD houses here on the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and paved roads and fencing and uh, it's a lot better. We had sewer. We used to have outhouses back in those early days in the 50s, you know. And we had swamps and ditches and irrigation ditches. So, even though uh, we're not, we're still affected by. You can see the Grand Sierra uh, uh, right behind us there, and uh, so we're still surrounded. And we have the freeway that runs right next to us, you know. And we've worked with, uh, uh, you know, uh, NDOT and and uh, worked out some issues just recently on uh, the Spaghetti Bowl in Reno and trying to. Uh, work out a win-win situation with that in depicting some of the native uh, design into the freeway. And we have some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, depiction of dancers and, and uh, wolves and all kind of uh, animals that are uh, right there at the intersection of, of uh, Glendale and, and the freeway right next to the Grand Sierra. So there's workable solutions. This is a a health center that was actually funded by the tribe ourselves. And the reason we were able to do this is uh, because we were mostly in poverty. We came to the state back in the early 90s and we passed a tax agreement with the state codified in 1991. And so there's a tax agreement that allows the tribes to collect taxes equal to or greater. Now that only is on tangible product, you know. So we're always concerned of uh, changes to even the tax scheme of the state. So if the state should go to a service tax or something like that, we don't really uh, deal with service taxes. So if you, for example, if you lowered the, lowered the uh, tax rate on sales to tangible products from what it is, 8% or whatever it is now, and you lowered that and you increased the service tax, the tribe would lose a tremendous amount of money in that because we don't really have services, we just have tangible products. And so I just want to kind of point, anytime the state does something, and that's why we always have to be at the table, because some things are done in, unintentionally that affects tribes. And that this health center we funded uh, out of the tax revenue that we had, it was a $16 million um, health center, and we service not only our tribe of 1,300 members, we service the urban Indian population, and I believe there's nearly 8,000 Native Americans in our catchment area, which is Washoe County. So there's Sioux, Navajo, just about every tribe. And just to let you know, more Native Americans live in the cities than on reservations, you know. I think there's nearly 50% of Native Americans live in the cities, uh, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Reno, Las Vegas, then they're on reservations. So it might be 50% uh, uh, live on reservations and 50% live in the cities because of the economy and jobs and those type things. In fact, that's what my tribe did. Uh, people came to Reno for jobs from Pyramid Lake, Washoe tribe, and our tribe uh, was basically founded because of the movement for jobs. And that's how we, the federal government bought a farm which is the Reno Sparks Indian Colony right next to the Grand Sierra now. So that's how we started. And then we added to that reservation later. Uh, this is our tribal council. We, like uh, Stacy said out of the Indian Commission, we have all these uh, same uh, responsibilities as the counties and the cities. We have court, we have police, we have health centers, social services, education, public works, planning, uh, you know, the tribal historic uh, preservation officers, environmental programs, uh, housing, you know, and so uh, uh, 
So those are just some of the programs we fund, and uh, we employ about 345 uh, members, not just tribal members, but uh, just general people in the, uh, you know, our non-native non also. I think about half our, our, our workers are non-native, and maybe half our tribal, and some are uh, other tribes also. Uh, this is a, a taken advantage of the tax agreement. We have some properties in South Reno where uh, our strategy was to locate uh, businesses on the reservation land where we didn't operate the businesses like uh, Mercedes, but we do operate the smoke shops, the lower picture there in Reno. Uh, that's what we first started out. That was the only business most of the tribes had was tobacco shops, and we still have those. But that's a declining business right now, so it's only going to last for so long. So the tribes are in a diversification position now. We're trying to diversify into other things, you know. And uh, it, sometimes it, it's about location, location. That old business uh, saying that uh, uh, some tribes, uh, because they're not located in the city like we are, you know, it's very difficult if you're in rural uh, Nevada or somewhere like this. So you don't have the same advantages, and that's why every tribe's different, and their strategy on economic development has to be different. And so it's almost like the SWOT analysis. You try to look at your strengths and weaknesses and determine what's my strength. Maybe it's not in, in taxation. Maybe it's something else. So I'm just kind of pointing out that we took advantage of our location in uh, Reno to uh, be able to do some of these things. And uh, so we, we, had a, we came to the legislature, actually, and talked to them about, for example, like Walmart located on reservation. And so that was kind of a, uh, you know, not everybody agreed with it, but uh, we came to the legislature and got a unanimous uh, consent from them to uh, move ahead. We contributed to the Washoe County School District a certain amount of revenue that still we pay uh, Washoe County School District every year, I think about a half million dollars uh, that we give them a check every year out of, uh, you know, to help out with the shortfalls that the schools were having. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And we, we recognize our, our um, you know, that we're part of the community too, and we have, uh, you know, our kids go to public schools, so that's why we did that. And then, um, and then we uh, also, uh, you know, participate in our town and some of the public events that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's all kind of different things that the tribe wants to uh, uh, depict our culture, you know, to let people know who we are. So sometimes we, we're tied in with the university. Uh, we are, uh, we have intergovernmental agreements with law enforcement, with the city, you know, has uh, as far as communication, uh, those type of things. Uh, we uh, interact with the school board. You know, I think we still need to get somebody from the tribe on the school board. <laughs> you know, so that's just uh, my hope uh, that'll happen. And then uh, regional transportation, like I told you, with the uh, freeway design and working with them. You know, in the olden days, we never had a say in the freeway uh, within uh, within 800. Uh, yards of the Reno Sparks Colony, nobody really came to us and said, what's your input into this freeway? And that was back in 1970 or whenever they beat the, uh, you know, built the, uh, construct that freeway. But this time we are at the table and we worked out, uh, the, you know, some good uh, agreements with them and they did some things uh, for us there too also. And, um, and then we work with all the federal agencies. You know, one thing about economic development is that it's, it's uh, you really have to build relationships, you know, with the cities and the counties and uh, in the state also. You know, there, what we usually do, even though the zoning of the tribes is different, you know, the, for example, our health center, uh, Reno has their own zoning where they want certain things, you know, they don't want to see certain things in a certain zone. Um, and so we built that health center in uh, near Washoe Medical because it lined up with the zoning for, you know, hospitals and, you know, not uh, 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 some undesirable uh, something else that was there. So we try to work with, uh, to create a win-win situation with most of our partners and we 
we meet with, uh, we try to work with the BLM and uh, some of the federal agencies too. And then one thing about um, relationship building, it's not just me, a tribal leader, who has the same status as a governor on a reservation. You know, the president of Navajo Nation has the same status as the president of the United States. And so what we try to do is, it's not just a relationship between m uh, myself and the governor, or whoever the governor is, Governor Lombardo, or it could be somebody else. The relationship is not with the chairman and him. We try to build those relationships from planner to planner, so that our planners will go down to Reno City so that they know each other, you know, and we aren't brought in, uh, they don't have to go to the top and I have to meet with the governor on some smaller issue. The planners can work it out, work it out because they have this relationship you know, already, we don't, we don't come in till, unless it's absolutely necessary. There's some uh, impasse that has to do with a major issue. So we built, uh, in, in our organization, we want this relationship, not just with me and the governor or the legislators, but, but our people at the grassroots level, you know, planner to planner, educator to educator, all those different things. So, and that, that really uh, lets everybody know what we're doing and we work together to try to create those win-win situations that, uh, that we're trying to strive for. And then uh, we, I know some of you were down to see the Wounded Souls um, uh, exhibit that Mishan Eben, our cultural, uh, or she's our THIPO, our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, but she's also our, our uh, cultural resource coordinator also. I think she invited you over to Reno Sparks and, and it's in a historic building, building there that's like uh, the same uh, uh, date as the Stuart Indian School. It's kind of out of the same bricks uh, that were put in place. That's what that building is uh, where you might have uh, went. But you know, the issue, you know, and, and you probably read about some of the mining issues. Uh, I've talked with some of the tribes, you know, and when you really think about it, that uh, exhibit has the, uh, it, it really is entitled Our Wounded Souls because it, it depicts the, the uh, you know, the effects of mining on tribal governments, you know, whether or not it's clean up or whatever it is on some of the, some of the mines that were left and not really cleaned up or, or it's, uh, or it doesn't take into, uh, you know, into, um, like the uh, consultation, you know, and some of the issues we're concerned about now. So it's not that we're against mining or anything like that, because some tribes do depend on mining. But you, you know, when you really look at all the money that came out of uh, gold and silver and now lithium and everything else, the tribes didn't benefit one thing out of that since the history of this, uh, this state, you know, when you really think they're, they never got a dime. And, and that picture didn't sit well with many of the tribes. So sometimes people ask, well, why are you opposing something? Well, that's part of it, but I think it's more of a cultural issue because there's a spirituality on some of our sacred sites and those different things that I don't think maybe everybody t totally understands that. So, so that's the reason you might uh, see uh, my tribe in the paper or something or, uh, uh, maybe challenging uh, some of those consultation issues that we didn't feel was adequately ad addressed. So, um, but we do have a lot of mining friends too, you know, it's not to say that we're against mining, but we have to protect our uh, sites and we have to protect our way of life and the water and everything else, the animals and, uh, you, know, you know, just about everything that's sacred to us. And uh, so we do invite you to come out and see our, our uh, Wounded Souls exhibit, you know, it kind of gives you a clear picture. And we also work with the mining uh, school up there. They loaned us some of their uh, pictures and some of, the, some of the things they use for mining, but it was really a, really a, a good exhibit that was put together in, in collaboration with the, with the engineering and mining uh, at, the, at the school. So uh, we hope you get a chance to look at that. But that's just a snapshot of what I uh, address and, and what we're trying to do. The housing issue um, is like everybody else, you know, we are overcrowded. Uh, there's not, HUD's not building as many houses as they used to in the past. We're trying to look at innovative way, the tax credits, for example, those type things. Every state's different, you know, as far as tax credit 
we want to uh, look a little bit about because I'm not sure if any tribes ever receive very many tax credits, you know, because they go to the states, then you have to go and uh, talk to the state about how many tax credits are available and can our tribe um, get any funding to do anything as far as apartments or whatever we're trying to build on reservations. So that's one area we need to explore a little further, you know, that we haven't really uh, done enough on, on that part when we've got housing shortages. So with that, it's just, a, you know, just some things that uh, we're working on. So I want to thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I could uh, try to answer if you have anything having to do with uh, the tribes. or And we work with the Intertribal Council of Nevada, too, which are the 28 uh, tribes in the state. We just had a meeting yesterday, so we come together quarterly to talk about issues or resolutions and, you know, le legislation and and to try to come up with a unified voice on some of the issues. So, so, um, so thank you. Thank you for your presentation. At this time, I'll go ahead and open up for questions. Uh, Assemblyman DeLong and then Assemblywoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate the presentation, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do you have uh, plans for expanding the housing out on the 13,000 acres that you were able to acquire in Hungary yes. Valley? Yes, we, we, in fact, we are now. We have uh, 25 houses that we're trying to build. Maybe you could state your name for the record. Oh, my name is Arlen, Mel Arlen Melendez, uh, Chairman Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Arlen. Oh, and uh, we are, we do have a, a, a project, and it's uh, we're trying to apply through HUD for some uh, block grant money that they have. And, uh, and nowadays, you have to try to find different sources of money to put it together. To you know, some of it's even a USDA loan for infrastructure like, uh, you know, uh, water tanks and all those different things. Then you got to have fine funding for the houses themselves. And the houses themselves is probably doubled in what the cost was, say, 10 years ago. So, you know, it's almost like you only can build 10 houses when you could have built 20 uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So it makes it more challenging. But we're trying to, uh, uh, that's why we're looking at tax credits or something along those lines. But... Um, so it, it's challenging for everybody. Assemblyman Taylor. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for coming, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to have you here. Yes, thank you. I have a comment and then a question. The comment is just to, um, just I think you were, you were very humble in speaking about the partnerships that uh, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony has in the community. Um, you mentioned, obviously, with my schoolwork background, um, the uh, about a half a million dollars a year um, from you know some of the businesses that you mentioned that you give to the school district that really makes a difference in the education being able to advance um, even some of the Indian education which is fantastic there and it, so it really does make and that's no small amount of money um, that you don't give begrudgingly <laughs> you show up and smile with the big check and everything so um, that's a, but that, that makes a difference in the district and for and for those students and then the way that you're um, the, um, the, the housing, I mean, the housing, the health center that you have during COVID, I mean, you made uh, um, testing and shots available to the entire community, not just to those um, from, the, from the colony or even those who are from an, an Indian background, just to step up and help in the community. Those are just a couple of examples that, that mm -hmm. most, um, that just come to my mind really easily. So just really just thank you on behalf of that community and the work that you've done. That's part of the relationships and the partnerships and it's, you're, you're, you're a, 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 you have a presence in the community as a whole. Um, under under your leadership, the the, the count colony does, and so it's it's really fantastic to see. And I wanted to make sure that was on the record because you're very humble in how you talk about that. But it's uh, you have a strong presence there. Um, and that being said, I, I wanted to ask you, and you, I know you have other colleagues, uh, some in the room, and then some I know on the um, when you have the intertribal council. Do you see other other communities and other communities, um, um, their tribal leaders being able to forge those same types of partnerships in the community? Because I know it's helpful in our community, and I think it's been helpful for for, uh, for 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 your council. I wonder if it's that if that's present in others across uh, across the state. Uh, you know. Uh one of the challenges that it takes uh, 
funding to even travel, you know, so you're limited on if, you know, not, not like my tribe can send me to Washington, D.C. quite a bit and on some of the uh, issues that we're dealing with. And, and some tribes just don't have the funding to really travel because they're rural and they have to come all the way to Reno. And, you know, if they had to go to D.C., well, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's just they only can go so many times, you know, mm -hmm. where I might have been back there, you know, seven or eight times during the year, those type things. So it's just, uh, but I think uh, when you talk about relationships, even if you don't have any money, you know what I mean? It, what you have to do is just uh, go and talk to people anyway, you know what I mean? And I, in fact, I went to the, the, and people change all the time. That's the other challenge. I went to the city council, Reno, they, they all changed. So I just had a meeting with each one of them, three of them, the new ones last week. So I went talk to them and I went down to city hall and we just talked and, went and told them a little bit about the tribal 101 like I kind of gave you here today. And, you know, just get to know them. And so, and the same thing with the county. I had to go over and meet some people there. So you, it, my job is to constantly try to keep these relationships uh, going because you have to know people to be successful, you know, and build those relationships with people, whether they're bankers, whether or not they're legislators, whether or not they're school board members or whoever. So I think it's real important. And I think tribes can help each other too. You know, I always thought about, well, why don't we come together and talk about just what we're talking about now? How can we learn, um, you know, what can you do if you don't have a lot of money, at least to be building those relationships, you know? And I think, uh, I think that's something that's really important. Because unfortunately, in a, a city like Reno, it just seems different than a rural, you know, rural way out there. I don't know if I'd have the same success if I were out in rural or some of these towns way out there because maybe the attitudes are different than say the legislators in Reno. Don't ask me why, I'm just saying what I hear from other tribal leaders is it's more difficult to try to deal with some of the, the city councils or the county commissioners than, and I'm just telling you what I hear sometimes from other tribal leaders. So. But you'd have to keep trying anyway, you know, regardless of whatever the attitudes may be or whatever. And so it just, you just have to kind of change that, uh, that dynamic of, of, you know, that uh, sometimes you just don't know why uh, people don't want to just talk, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, uh, you know, in the long run, I think it, it really does uh, help to, to uh, talk to people. And I think it's uh, really helped us out. In, in progressing. You've done that very well, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I don't have a question for you, but I do want to thank you for having taking the time to come out and speak to our committee so that we can learn a little bit more about what we can do as legislators and as lawmakers to ensure that we're we're working with the tribes instead of just passing policy that impacts uh, native lands uh, and your government. So I think there's a lot more work that we can do, and we hope to continue this conversation throughout the legislative session and not just yeah. uh, make it a one-day event. Yeah, because we're working right now on a consultation uh, policy, I think, with the Indian Commission, and they're, they're kind of fine-tuning it now, so we're going to be giving some input into that. And, it, and it's just like the federal government, when, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat president, you know, the tribes are always saying, well, who gives the orders or uh, mandates your uh, agencies to... Um, to include the tribes or to dialogue with them for inclusion before, before um, you know, decisions are made. And so even the federal government has, uh, has this, uh, you know, uh, policy that the president himself will say, I want you, each one of you uh, agencies, whether it's BLM, whether it's Forest Service, Treasury, or whatever it may be, I want you to meet with the tribes. I want you to talk to them. I want their input before any major uh, decisions made that affects them. And I think that's what it is. And that's what we're trying to do with the state too, to come up with a, a, a policy of consultation that, that uh, you know, and it works both ways too. You know, we can do some, some things, I guess, that can affect the state too. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for taking the time to come out today. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you. 
and I believe, uh, unfortunately, we ran a little over time, and so they're probably missing some of the celebration <laughs> in 3100. So uh, thank you so much for coming and joining us, and please let the others know that we really do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. As a reminder to committee, we're hoping to get out of here right on time at 11 o'clock. Uh, we do have a presentation uh, with the Division of Enterprise Information Technology Services under the Department of Administration. Um, when you all are ready, I think we just need kind of a quick overview. I'm sure my committee members took a, had a chance to look at the slides ahead of time. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Torres and members of the Assembly Committee on Government Affairs. For the record, my name is Timothy Galuzzi, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Division Administrator for Enterprise IT Services and the State's Chief Information Officer. With me today are members of my leadership team, our State Chief Information Security Officer, Bob Denhart, our Chief Enterprise Architect, David Axtell, and my Chief of Policy and Communications, Javon Sotek. I'm thankful for the opportunity to provide a brief overview of Enterprise IT Services Division, or EATS. The purpose and statutory authority for EATS can be found in NRS 242. EATS is necessary for the coordinated, orderly, and economical processing of information in state government to ensure economical use of information systems and to prevent the unnecessary proliferation of equipment and personnel among the various state agencies. The purpose and responsibilities of the division are to perform and provide information technology services for state agencies, to provide technical advice, but not administrative control of the information systems within state agencies, and as authorized of local government agencies. Creation and management of IT policy, standards, and procedures found in NRS 242.115, security validation, testing, and monitoring of information systems found in 242.171, and support of the state's IT advisory board, or ITAB. If this sounds like an incredibly wide scope, it's because it is. We would not be able to accomplish all of this if it wasn't for the incredibly talented IT professionals, technicians, and support staff whom I have the pleasure of serving with, including the IT teams and leaders from our partner agencies. To accomplish our charge established in NRS 242, we have developed our division's vision, mission, and goals. Our vision is for, the EAT, for EATS to be a trusted collaborative partner, empowering the state by maximizing value, security, and availability of enterprise technology services. Our mission has three tenets. One, to effectively support the technology needs of state agencies and the residents they serve. Two, to plan, maintain, and evolve enterprise technologies and security to support the state. And three, to foster trust through transparent collaboration and communication with our partners. We also have four goals that, we, that will guide us to achieve our mission and vision. One, EATS strengthens trust with partners. Two, EATS develops positive workplace culture. Three, EATS both invests in and obtains the resources that enable success. And four, EATS advances modern technologies to support the evolving requirements of the state. You may have noticed a theme here. The focus on collaboration, communication, and support to our executive branch partners is absolutely paramount for our ability to provide efficient and effective technology services. The ultimate goal of being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Now that we have discussed the mission and purpose of EATS, I would like to introduce you to the units that make all of this possible. EATS has an authorized headcount of 190. We are currently experiencing a vacancy rate of approximately 20%. I'm sure that you have heard and will continue to hear about challenges that the executive branch agencies are facing regarding recruitment and retention. And this is doubly so for technology positions that require highly skilled workers. Despite the vacancy rate and the other challenges wrought by the pandemic, the collaboration, communication, and support 
offered by, the, by those people serving EATS and the state have been 110% through the last biennium. Those 190 authorized staff members are organized into five uh, operational units. The Office of the CIO, also known as EATS Administration, Agency IT Services, proposed to become Client Services Unit, Computing Services Unit, sometimes synonymous with the State Computer Facility, Network Services Unit, formerly one half of the Communications and Computing Unit, and Office of, the Inform Office of Information Security. I'll provide a brief overview discussing each unit's purpose and responsibility. The Office of the CIO provides leadership, management, and direct support for the operational units in the division. This office is not only charged with the day-to-day -day management of the division, but also supports interagency collaboration and communications. The Office of the CIO is responsible for the creation and management of statewide IT strategy, IT governance committees, and maintaining statewide IT policy. This unit is comprised of EATS executive leadership, its direct support staff, and the Enterprise Architecture Group. The Enterprise Architecture Group is responsible for the management of the Technology Investment Administration and review required in NRS 242.171 subsection 2. This review includes all proposed technology investments from executive branch agencies with an estimated value of $50,000 or more. This enables our division to review the technical implications of, in the infrastructure and to find opportunities for collaboration with agencies looking for similar solutions, to identify efficiencies, to find economies of scale, and to share knowledge. The information collected from the technology investment notification and cloud investment notification process for state agencies is key to this group's charter to create a statewide technology strategy and architecture. We hope that in the near future, we will be able to provide statewide technology portfolio reporting and dashboards to stakeholders and state business leaders to better inform their decision making. The agency IT services unit, proposed to become the client services unit, consists of application development and support, client services and infrastructure, and continuous quality improvement groups. These groups provide direct information technology, or IT, support for partner agencies in the areas of application development, state website platform management, and accessibility initiatives under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Database administration, development and hosting, telephone operators, and desktop support. This unit also operates an enterprise service desk with 24-hour emergency support and after-hour service for public safety agencies. When our law enforcement professionals in the field need after-hours IT support, these are the folks who answer that call. This unit is home to the direct support for professionals who will travel to our partner agency's office and solve problems every day. The Computing Services Unit provides numerous computer processing services using a variety of systems and technologies and is responsible for managing, operating, and supporting the state computer facility and server environments. Staff tasks include enterprise software management, including the business productivity suite, computer operations, production servers, mainframe systems management, storage management, printing, web application hosting services, server maintenance and hosting, email management and maintenance, and a number of associated business continuity functions. When we discuss being able to leverage economies of scale and building platforms that create a more efficient and effective state government like Microsoft Teams, this unit is an example of just that. The state private cloud, or silver cloud, that is hosted in the state environment is home to a multitude of agencies and servers that provide cost-effective solutions and services. The Network Services Unit is comprised of three groups that provide data communication and network services to state and Nevada stakeholders. And in the case of Network Transport Services Group, these services are also provided to private industry. All three groups, Network Engineering, Telecommunications, Network Transport, Support, network transport Services, have the responsibility to provide reliable, secure, and cost-effective voice and data communications 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Customer agencies include Department of Administration, Nevada State Police, Secretary of State, Department of Taxation, Department of Motor Vehicles, Department of Welfare Services, and numerous other agency stakeholders. 
We can also say that we've recently worked closely with the Governor's Office of Science, Innovation and Technology to provide expertise to increase fiber optic services to underserved rural locations throughout Nevada to increase availability to the state's constituents. Additionally, this unit is responsible for maintaining up-to-date voice and data infrastructure that must meet industry standards to maintain a robust security posture to thwart malicious activity in an ever-evolving threat landscape. These units must also meet federal security standards to meet audit criteria. All states' networks must be able to meet and or exceed requirements of federal agencies, such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Departments of Health and Human Services and Homeland Security to ensure security compliance for Nevada stakeholders. Our Network Transport Services Group specializes in microwave technology, which uses the equipment that you see in the photos to transmit and receive radio signals over long distances. Microwave is critical to Nevada's emergency communications infrastructure, and these images of our microwave sites demonstrate some of the extreme conditions that this infrastructure is exposed to. The primary mission of the Office of Information Security is to act as a center of excellence for all information security matters within the executive branch through creating and managing an enterprise information security program, providing guidance on information and cybersecurity best practices, and assisting in the creation and maintenance of an internal information security technology infrastructure. The secondary mission of this unit is to provide enterprise level security tools and services to the executive branch agencies in support of their security programs. Tools and services that are of a general benefit or are required for compliance to NRS are best purchased and managed at this level to leverage the economies of scale in licensing and platform management and to ensure equal access for all agencies. The Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO, dir directs response to incidents, establishes appropriate standards and controls, manages security technologies, and directs the establishment and implementation of policies and procedures. The CISO chairs the State Information Security Committee and is on the Nevada Cybersecurity Task Force and the Commission on Homeland Security's Resilience Advisory Committee. That concludes my short overview of enterprise IT services. I would happy to field any questions that you may have. Thank you, um, Mr. Galuzzi, and I, I appreciate you talking so fast because it makes me look like I'm the slowest talker in the world. <laughs> All right, at this time, are there any questions from the committee members? All right, it looks like we're saving them all for AB 18. So at this time, we will open the hearing on AB 18. This measure revises provisions relating to the Division of Enterprise Information Technology Services of the Department of Administration. Um, you may go ahead and begin. Good morning again, Chair Torres and committee members. For the record, my name is Timothy Galuzzi and I'm the Administrator of Enterprise Information Technology Services Division in the Department of Administration and the state's Chief Information Officer. I'm here today to introduce Assembly Bill 18, which proposes minor changes to NRS 242 to bring language current. This bill's proposed language, language accomplishes three goals. First, it updates the definition of NRS 242 related to technology to be aligned with present industry usage and standards. Second, it updates unit names in NRS 242 to align with the current organizational structure of our division and to resolve legacy issues resulting from the 2011 reorganization of the Department of Information Technology and the 2017 organizational changes. Third, it updates impacted definitions in NRS 233F with conforming language. Thank you for your time and, and the opportunity to introduce this bill. At this time, I can answer any questions that the committee may have. Well, that was a very quick presentation. I think it might have been even shorter than the bill. That's a miracle. <laughs> All right, so at this time, I'll go ahead and open it for any questions from committee members. All right, I do have a couple questions then. Um, all right, um, so the first question I have is, can you talk a little bit more about the definition, the updated definition of the network transport services? I believe that's in section nine, which is page five of the bill. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair, for the question. Once again, Timothy Galuzzi, Enterprise IT Services Administrator and State Chief Information Officer for the record. Um, this is just to bring the, uh, the, the definition back to more of an industry standard as the uh, communication and computing definition or uh, title of that unit um, could be a, a little confusing to folks. Um, I think network services is, is a, a clearer definition of what this unit is, is supposed to accomplish. Thank you. And is there anywhere else in, in either statute or regulation that we see a similar definition or something that we can kind of compare it to? Thank you, Chair, for the question. Once again, Timothy Galuzzi for the record. Um, there is conforming changes that we're requesting in this bill to uh, uh, NRS 233F. Um, and so the, 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 the reason and the genesis for uh, this needing to change is at, at one point those, those units were divisions within the Department of Enterprise IT, uh, formerly known as DOIT. Um, and so when DOIT got transitioned to be a division within the Department of Administration, um, those names didn't change. And so um, in NRS, uh, it, it currently establishes that the, the communications and compute unit are one and the same, um, but operationally and uh, the, the way that we've been operating for at least uh, the, past, the past decade, uh, those have been separate units. And one is responsible for network services, uh, the telecommunications, the, the microwave infrastructure, and the, the wide area network. And the other is responsible for the computing services uh, that, that can be found in the state's computer facility, uh, also known as Silver Cloud. So then just to clarify, this is kind of cleaning up um, like the statute so that the definitions align with what the, the office is currently doing. It's not really adding responsibilities. It's really just kind of clarifying the responsibilities that the office has already assumed. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Once again, Timothy Galuzzi for the record, absolutely. Um, th this is how we are operating currently and have been operating for the past decade uh, with, this, uh, with this current uh, major structure uh, with, within the Enterprise IT Services Division. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Assemblyman Carter. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and it, you may have just answered it because you've already been working this way, but my question was, is the current staffing level able to take on all of the responsibilities and duties that are outlined? Thank you for the question. Uh, Chair, through you to Assemblyman uh, Carter. Once again, uh, Timothy Galuzzi for the record. Um, the way that we build our budget is based off of the, the, the utilization uh, projections from our, our partner agencies. So our partner agencies across the executive branch will come to us and say, here is our need, here is the server infrastructure that we need to, to accomplish our mission, here's the telecommunications infrastructure that we need to accomplish our mission, and through the, the standard budget process, we make sure that we're right-sized for it. Um, you know, it's. I've got amazing professionals within my organization who, who go above and beyond every day and they're able to accomplish Herculean tasks. Um, we've, we've gotten really good about accomplishing our mission that's uh, with the resources that are given to us in the executive branch budget. So uh, for what our current scope is, I think we have the appropriate headcount. Um, you know, if that scope changes in the future, if that scope grows in the future, uh, we would probably ask for, for some more support. Any additional com questions to the committee members? Was someone in MacArthur? Oh, it looks like he's good. Okay, thank you about that. Um, all right, at this time, we'll hear testimony and support for AB 18. So I'll invite any guests from here in Carson City to come testify in support uh, for AB 18. And in Las Vegas, any any uh, any individuals wishing to testify in support? And BPS, if you could check to see if there's anybody on the line wishing to testify in support of AB 18. 
Uh, Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. And I'll go ahead and wait for a second for we'll we'll check again to see if there's any callers calling in. Uh, but I'll go ahead and open it for opposition um, here in the room in Carson City. And opposition in Las Vegas. And BPS, is there anyone on the line in either support or opposition for AB 18? Uh, Chair, we have no callers in opposition or support at this time. All right, I'll go ahead and open it up. If there's anybody wishing to testify neutral anywhere, just go ahead and come let us know. <laughs> Don't all rush up at once. All right, BPS, is there anybody on the line um, for support, opposition, or neutral for AB 18? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers. All right. Um, uh, thank you for coming already back. Um, and it, I'm just giving it to you for closing remarks. Thank you, Chair. Once again, for the record, Timothy Galuzzi, uh, Enterprise IT Services Administrator and State CIO. Um, I want to thank you, Chair, and the committee for, for granting us the opportunity to, to tell Eats' story a little bit today and uh, for your support on this bill, and we look forward to it moving forward. Thank you, and thank you for your efficient presentation. I look forward to you training all the other presenters this session on how to do that. At this time, I'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB, 18, on AB 18. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and open up the public comment uh, portion of the meeting. Every person has two minutes to provide testimony. Public comment may be submitted in writing to the committee up to 24 hours after the hearing. Is there anyone in person wishing to give public comment in Las Vegas or in Carson City? BPS, is there anybody on the line to give public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. Gonna go ahead and just give it one moment. All right, I imagine there's still nobody wishing to testify in public comment, VPS? Uh, yes, Chair, we have no callers at this time. Perfect, so just as a reminder to the committee, tomorrow we have a very busy day. We're gonna have uh, two presentations, one from the state controller um, and then another one from the Department of Veterans Services as well as three bills. So come on time um, and be, and be ready for a very quick, uh, quick and busy day. Uh, congratulations to those of you who got to hear your first bill hearing. Um, and our next meeting will be tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.